Hello, uh, my name is Jace Clayton. Um, I also am known as DJ Rupture. And yeah, we have about an hour here, so I'm gonna try and talk for about half of that. I could talk about music and money and autonomy. Um, and then the last 20 minutes or so, we can sort of open it up to a wider conversation. I think that would be nice. Um, but so the name of my talk is the name of a book that I published last year um, called Uproot. Travels in 21st Century Music and Digital Culture. And the, the kind of basic idea behind the book was me looking at my career as a DJ, which began, I began DJing in the late 90s. <clears throat> and actually my first international gig was here in Berlin in 2001. Um, and then I just kept on going. And so looking back around six years ago, I realized that my career as a DJ had spanned this entire movement from vinyl records, CDs and cassettes, physical objects, um, to the world of MP3s, um, network listening via YouTube, kids making music on laptops. Um, so watching this very fast transition from analog to digital. And not only that, I was watching it from the vantage of someone who was really kind of in the music culture. One of the things about being a DJ is that um, it's extremely portable. You know, so at this point I've played in like some 35 countries. And more often than not, it would be me showing up somewhere alone um, and just being really kind of immersed in whatever was going on in, in the places where I found myself. So I had this view of um, this changing world of sound, um, but it was very much a kind of like street level, ground, ground level view of what was going on. Um, and so the narratives I found there were often very different from the narratives I was seeing in mainstream media. And that is kind of what prompted me to really sit down and try and condense some of those experiences into, into a book. Um, and as a kind of shorthand for some of the music I'm writing about, I like to call it, call it World Music 2.0. And so, of course, we've all heard the term world music. And world music began right here. So, of course, that's Paul Simon's Graceland. This 1987 album that he did in part by going down to South Africa and working with Ladysmith Black Mombazo, sort of um, a cappella group, large choir. And it was a huge success for Paul Simon. It sort of reinvigorated his career. And one of the things that, that the impact it had was that at the you know, sort of record industry executives, they decided to call a meeting in London and they said, well, you know, Graceland is such a big hit, um, but how do we market other music from different types of the world? How do we tap into the sort of economic energy generated by Graceland? Um, and so they really said, okay, it's, it's an issue of marketing. We need a term for this type of sound. Um, and, and at the meeting, all sorts of different terms, the notes are online from the meeting, and people were suggesting hot, people were suggesting tropical, but at the end of this long meeting, they said, okay, we're gonna call it world music, and specifically, we're gonna like, communicate to all the record stores and distributors that you need to make a world music section for music from different parts of the world, um, and that's going, to be, that's going to be it. And they, they did that quite successfully. You know, now world music is a sort of large industry, um, but world music is it's a very top-down entity. You know, it's all about major labels. It's all about a and R's sort of choosing very specific artists um, and sort of grooming them and putting them into a kind of a very streamlined system. And so, so much of what's interesting to me about musical culture nowadays is what I'm calling, in contrast with that, World Music 2.0. And this is a photo I took in downtown Cairo, um, right kind of around the time of Arab Spring. And to me, this is a kind of visual representation of World Music 2.0. Like you've got the hieroglyphic graffiti in the background that are sort of referencing this ancient Egyptian culture, but done in spray paint. You've got kids with bright colors and skinny jeans, and yet there's always this sort of overlay of tradition. Like all the elements of, um, of what it means to be Egyptian are kind of wrapped up and somehow fighting in these online, offline spaces. But specifically, I, th I think of, for me, the hallmark of what I'm calling world music 2.0, of course, is the 2.0 aspect of it. And so it is what happens when you make, what happens when the computer um, becomes the, the, the main instrument? What happens when the computer turns into the folk instrument? And so we've all heard all sorts of different types of this music, but it's remix culture taps into this. Um, it's the kind of 
I like to call it as like music that's sort of arising from the condition of YouTube. You know, people are going online, listening to videos, and they're saying, hey, you know, in this case, I come from Egypt, this enormous tradition of classical music, but I'm also getting beamed in Shakira videos, I'm also looking at Tiesto videos online, and I have a cracked copy of Fruity Loops. Like, what do I do next? How do I express what it means to be young now in this very particular moment? Um, and it is a music with, uh, it's a lot of sort of peer-to-peer -peer communication. It's a, mu it's a music that, um, it's kind of far from the money, you can say. And here's, just to give you a clip of what I'm talking about, in one instance in Cairo, this is a, a genre that's basically around 10 years old, a little bit more than 10 years old now. And it started by the producer, who you're going to hear, DJ Figo. Um, and basically, he, he sat down and said, OK, in my, in my zone, this music called Shabi is big, but I'm really interested in club sounds. I'm really interested in working with electronics. How can I work with the computer to kind of update that? And this is a video of him. It's a fan-made video, which is also part of World Music 2.0 culture. Um, and it's, a, it's a basically a diss track. So the kid you'll see in this video, it's, a, it's a Amir Haha, his competitor, and he's kind of relentlessly making fun of him. But the sound is, is what I'm very... <laughs> So that type of informal music making, um, it's happening all over the world right now in all sorts of unlikely places. And in each place, it kind of contextualizes in a different way. Um, and this is a shot of Figo's studio. You know? And so once again, it's people with very little means often who are kind of entering into this flow. And maybe it begins casually, and maybe they keep going, and it goes away from something other than a remix or an edit. Maybe they start making, mus making money off it, or maybe not. Maybe it's just part of, like I said, a folk music, music as conversation. But as a conversation in this time when you can make a video like that using preset video edits, taking in these aspects of silly pop culture, um, but then also you know, rapping against your, your buddy in the next neighborhood. This is a shot of the sort of that same area. He, he, Figo and his friends, um, they raise pigeons on the rooftop. But one of the most interesting things to me about World Music 2.0 is how it does two things. First of all, it completely scrambles the timelines. I think, you know, f coming, coming up through the 90s listening to music, I had a very specific sense of who did what when. Um, and that was kind of key to my understanding, you know, like a new record would come in and you'd pick it up and you'd say, okay, how does this fit into the overall picture? Figo and kids like him all over the world, they are existing in an environment when YouTube recommended video suggestions, that kind of is more important than any idea of this came first, this is what's proper, this is not. Like I said, it's a time of um, the influencers are sort of wild, but it's no, longer t it's no longer linked to any specific time. And likewise, it really messes with this idea of a local, of a local sound. Um, we're used to this idea of folk music being somehow authentic and tied to place, and that's certainly part of it. But this summer, I was walking through Lower Manhattan. This is right near City Hall, right near like um, you know Wall Street, and I heard coming out of this uh, hot dog vendor, this Egyptian hot dog vendor, the very same track which I just played, which was an obscure tune from you know five years ago. And I was like, this is so fascinating. Um, 
And it, it points to the way in which, of course, there's every city is shot through with waves of different people. Um, and so one of the funny things about Manhattan is that you know, m many of the sort of kebab vendors are Egyptian, and they're often playing this amazing music. Um, but it also speaks to the spread of Figo. He's operating completely outside of a label system, and yet he's able to like hotwire, reach out, end up bumping out of a, a street in Manhattan, um, and that's just kind of normal. And so I became fascinated in a lot of, you know, a lot of how this is happening all over the world is, is really in, is, is quite interesting. Um, and yet, there's always the flip side of that, which is, you know, one of the things about the fluidity of digital technology, the ease which we, with which we can watch a, YouTube, watch a YouTube video or download an MP3, that kind of goes up against the difficulties that people have in moving, that people have moving across borders. And so one of the things we're seeing in Europe right now is kind of the, the flip side of this, which is that, you know, looking at, you know, people ending up in the Greek, Greek islands and trying to get their way to Europe, you'll have people from all over the world, they'll have a cell phone loaded with music, um, but they will no longer have a country. And so what is it like to make music and to listen in this particular type of time? And so if World Music 2.0 was play and slipperiness, um, to me, I see its counterpart, uh, that type of movement, in rap, specifically in money in rap, um, and how the sounds of rap music travel so quickly from engines like Atlanta or New York City all over the world. And I was thinking more about this. Okay, you know, on the one thing, we know how sounds and samples travel, how DJs accelerate that, and it's a, a sense of great joy. Um, but then let's look at how kind of how, how money moves around and how ideas of money move around in hip hop. And so, you know, ever since its inception, rap has been about um, kind of a, it's a boasting genre. You know, I'm the better rapper, but it's a genre that likes to like boast about wealth. I've got more money than you, I'm better than you. And that was the kind of main sort of discourse around money in rap music for a while. Millions of examples, but you, for, you can look at uh, 50 Cent's I Got Money. 2003, he's sampling a song from 1987, but the first verse of this 50 Cent art, um, song, he's talking about how he sold, you know, he, took, he sold his shares in Glasso water um, to Coke and got $500 million. Like, that's what that rap song would become. But in recent years, I noticed how the ways in which people were talking about money in rap had shifted. It, gave, it went from people saying, you know, I've got money, I've got lots of money, I've got more money than you, to a discussion as money as, as something that actually regulates how we talk to each other, and actually how money gets in the way of listening and blocks access to it. Here's an example from 2014. This is T.I. featuring Young Thug. We got London on the track, Yeah, man, T.I. being this motherfucker with me, nigga. To the max with it. Rex. I count six shots. Busting out the band though. A nigga jury real metal like a can no fleet. I went from rad to riches to a feature with tip. I went from smart car to a bitch with some smart look. And that if a knee made my hip limp. I'm going fishing with these little bitty strip dips. And my bank roll kind of big dip. Woo. She gonna bring it on a big ship. Uh, quite trail, no quick trip. I got does in the alley, no tip. Yeah. Woo. Hey. She ain't wanna have a good day. Smoke way more weed than a guy in LA. That, that, that. I hold them birds to next May. Damn, never let them fly away. What? Aye, 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 aye. This is what my nigga tip say. Money. Yeah. Don't be blowing me up, nigga. I ain't getting no. If it ain't about the money. Ain't no use to you uh -huh. ringing my line, stop wasting my time. If it ain't about the money. Nah, I can even hear what you say. I ain't finna do shit. If it ain't about the money. Say, money. Bitch, you can miss me with it. It's kind of this amazing claim. He's like, if you're not talking to me about money, I can't even hear what you're saying, you know? Um, and then it, lots of songs riffed on this theme for a while. Um, but then in the past year, the money talk has gone even further. Um, so here's a song off of Ray Schremmer's last album, um, Swang. And I'll play it through the chorus. But the thing that's... Um, keeps flipping me is when they say, when the money talks, what is there to say? 
talks what is there to say and so I, I keep returning to this line and it's kind of it's kind of an incredible admission and first off in this song and in a lot of the current trap you get this kind of there's a, a sort of sadness or melancholy in the sound itself um, the future and Drake album for example um, and it's it's to me it's linked up with what I what's anhedonia you know this idea that we no longer like our pleasure receptors are blown out. You know, you get this a lot in Future's music. You know, he's rich, he's loaded, he's on drugs, he's surrounded by women, but he's still sort of blown out and kind of unhappy. And so there's something about that saturation with capital that leads to a kind of exhaustion. And even in lyrics, which sometimes boast it, it always curves around to the underside. Um, but more specifically, when money talks, what is there to say? It's this kind of acknowledgement that um, to be any sort of performing artist, um, to be a rapper, there's something like the money, it's a, it's a form of speech even larger than you. And to some extent, you're only performing a role within that. Um, you're sort of underneath the sign of money. Um, and so if that thing speaks louder than you, what can you actually say? Um, but then getting into like the nitty gritty of the current hip hop sonics, um, when money talks, what is there to say? It's, it's this interesting admission of, okay, you know, lyrical content, what any particular rapper is saying um, actually matters less and less. You know, we're, we've, gone, we've come a long way from the glory days of 1990s lyricism and narrative and rap, um, and you get all sorts of other things become possible. And so now I'm gonna play a clip um, from Returning to Young Thug. But this, I, but if the lyrics are less important, what else becomes important? And it turns out that it's all the sort of ex extra linguistic sounds, all the grunts and the rattles and the texture of the voice and what a voice sounds like when you're pushing it through auto-tune or pushing it through a vocoder or pushing it to the edge of what it can do. Um, and so this is the first little bit of a Harambe from Young Thug. grunts, he whispers, he goes into falsetto, hello Theo, his voice breaks, um, he's really kind of pushing the edge and it's all these kind of, you know, you could call them almost like blues tropes, but here it's, as in many, many songs like this, the lyrical content is somehow completely secondary, the money's talking, we're left with image and we're left with sound. And, and one of the kind of incredible things about rap music in particular is for the people at the very top, they're existing in a space where they often become rich and famous simply by making songs that talk about how they're rich and famous. So like it works with Migos, it works with Young Thug, it works with Ray Shremmerd, and that's almost like casting a spell, you know? So that's the power of language and conviction and a whole lot of luck. Um, but then, as a genre, it is deeply, deeply complacent. 
with all the, everything that's worst about capitalism, predatory capitalism, it's on full, conspicuous consumption, all the misogyny, all the heteronormativity, um, it's all kind of at the heart of hip hop um, and part of our weird attraction for it, I believe. But when the money talks, what is there to say? The flip side of that is that there's this really interesting space for a kind of avant-garde in sound um, that is alive and thriving. Um, and it's precisely those contradictions which bind them together um, and makes it such an interesting genre for me to listen to now. Um, far more interesting than it was back in the sort of golden era of the 1990s when hip-hop records are mostly you know, sampling jazz records and looking back to a kind of nostalgic an iconic black past, um, that has been broken open, broken apart, um, and we're left with this very, very strange space. And one of the ways in which the, that space opens up things is how we've seen trap sounds go global so quickly. Um, so kind of the ground up DIY aspect of World Music 2.0, you know, unknown kids remixing each other, putting the sounds out there for people, anyone to listen to, and something like rap music, this major industry that it's become, I see, I see a lot of what um, myself and my peers engaged in as kind of somewhere in between those two worlds. And I think a pivotal moment for the, you know, sort of underground electronic sounds touching the big money happened in 1999 with, with this album, with Moby's Play. And you know, this is kind of prior, what can we say about Play? This is this, it was the first album to license every single song on it to some sort of commercial advertisement use. Um, it, it made Moby incredibly wealthy. Um, it remains the best-selling electronic album. And yeah, and it really marked a turning point um, between the kind of, in the 1990s, um, up until 99, you know, Fugazi, I'd like to look at Fugazi as this kind of icon of do it yourself. You know, throughout the 90s, the music industry was just starting to be shaken up by the sort of incoming dematerializations. So it was, but it was still really strong. And not only that, it was still very, um, it was very kind of like what we call mom and pop shops. So you could have an indie band like Fugazi who said, okay, we're gonna own our distribution network. We're only going to, to advertise in publications, independent publications we like. We're gonna sort of like keep it all in-house, control our masters, understand and own how it all goes. Um, but then as, you know, as we know now, we're living in the era of, of networked identity. So suddenly it's embeds, suddenly it streams. If you want to be independent, what do you do? Maybe you get a Bandcamp account, maybe you're still on Spotify. All of the ways in which um, the sort of the limited nature of physical media allowed artists to have a kind of careful control over its dissemination um, have vanished. And so any sort of idea of independence we've had has something seeded and we're entering in, into a new space. Um, and like I said, I think Moby anticipated that. And I'm gonna play two quick clips from his album, and you'll see the records he sourced and sampled, and then what he did with them. Trouble so hard, oh Lord, trouble so hard. So for me, it's impossible to talk about the commercial success of Moby without at least thinking through some of these samples. Um, and in a way, the album was, was sort of ethically produced. You know, he was taking fair use um, public, uh, what is it, public domain samples of old 
black American blues and soul and gospel singers. But it was all legit, you know? He was going into the archives, digging them up, and recontextualizing. Like, this is remix culture, this is sounds fluidity um, in full effect. And yet, the, the, at the same time, like the, the cracked voices and the strange manipulation of voice that we see in rap, of course there's this long history of it, and a lot of these voices are very much embedded in that history. And that history comes from this idea of, okay, these are the, the rigors and all the frictions of the lived black experience are somehow embodied in those sounds. Um, and not only that, Moby's tracks sell better um, because they're charged with the power um, of, those, of those old voices. And, and not only that, you can't simply sell those old voices for Oldsmobile or Budweiser or whatever it is. Um, you need it to be repackaged in a very sort of clean and presentable way, which, which is what he did. Um, and so it's not about some, some notion of theft for me. Um, it's more about this idea of a reminder that in an American context, the only authentic thing about blackness, the black experience, is dispossession, is having something, creating something, um, a voice, a song, a style, um, all these things that live in oral culture, um, and, having, and not having full control over it having it taken away from you or modified in some way, um, even if it's done quite legally and all proper, which is what happened with Moby. Um, but this idea, the central fact of black authenticity in America is dispossession. Um, and so that flips back to this idea of do-it-yourself culture, um, to, to me and you and the audience as artists. Um, and it's almost like this notion of blackness, it's simply a, um, this, it's a kind of a, a vanguard precariousness. Um, but it asks the, the broader question of what aspects of your own narrative do you control you know, as a creative? Um, what aspects do you have the power to change or redirect as you see fit? Um, and one of the things, I mean, writing a book is a sort of terrible, awful, long process, like crawling across an auditorium filled with glass and dirt. You know, it's painful, it's slow, and you feel incredibly isolated. But one of the great things about writing a book is you can sort of expand all these thoughts at length and really kind of dig in in a way that you simply couldn't with an essay, with a tweet, um, with an album. Um, and so in one of the chapters of Uproot, um, to loop back, I said, let me trace my kind of personal history through uh, this relationship with money and ideas of artistic and economic freedom. And for, so I had to open this chapter kind of putting all my cards on the table. And so, you know, I, so I talk a bit about Fugazi, and then I talk a bit about Moby as a transitional figure, but then I talk about me. And so in 2002, um, early on in my DJ career, I was in uh, Ponte Vedra, Spain, playing at a festival. And it was a festival sponsored by an energy drink. Um, and as it turns out, the DJ booth um, was actually had a glowing logo of this wretched energy drink built into it. And they hadn't told me, you know? And so it's like 1,000, 2,000 people. And I was like, great. And you know, so I go out to start my set. And I was like, wait, I can't. I can't play these records knowing that everyone's looking at me and seeing this glowing, terrible logo. And so I take off my jacket and I sort of drape it over the thing. I was like, okay, and then I began. Yes, right? <laughs> it's just like, no one told me. And then a man in a suit with a headset, like this one comes over and he taps me on the shoulder and he's like, no, you need to take that off or they're gonna stop the music, this is our advertiser, and I was like, no, you know, and arguing in Spanish, which felt empowering. And I was like, no, no se puede. Um, but I was like, no one. And so I held my ground. And I was like, you can pull the plug. No one told me about this. End of story. And so he went, talked to another guy in a suit, and then they let me perform. Um, and so I did the set. On it went. Um, and it did. It felt, like a, it felt like a minor triumph, you know. And, and part of that is it's 
like one of the few things artists have is the sense of artistic freedom. You know, it's like I want when I'm teaching, I want to make my own choices, steer through, steer through the world of sound in my own way, and no one can tell me how to do that. And I'm aware that those choices will impact my economic viability, um, my tour ability, my presentability, but somehow that is critical to uh, to the intensity and the love I have for DJing. Um, but times changed. This was 2002, and that form of branding was so in your face and rough. Um, ten years later, I was trying to raise money for a project of mine called Sufi Plugins, um, which is a you know a series of plugins built around non-Western ideas of sound. Uh, and I wanted to return to Egypt to make more, and um, and no one would fund it maybe unsurprisingly, and friends kept telling me, go to, the, go to Wretched Energy Drink, go to that company, they will love this project, they will give you money. And I was like, I don't know, and people are like, well, you know, they're giving, they're giving money to good writers to cover lesser known aspects of music, they're documenting electronic music culture and all these things, you should do it. Um, and I was like, okay, I'll have a meeting with them. And so I had, you know, so. Ten years, almost to the day after Spain, I'm on the Skype with them, you know, three representatives of this company, and talking about my talking about the project, and it became very clear um, that they weren't interested and that this was not going to happen. Um, but I did take a few steps towards it. You know, I was like, I have this very quirky idiosyncratic project. I can't get funding for it elsewhere. Let me try this out. Um, and again, the, the thing about writing through this is it allows me to sort of unspool all these complexities. Like, I don't, I don't think any artist can, can live in that sort of, in the Fugazi world, in this DIY, create your, create your scene, just tour, boom, boom, boom. There are too many interdependencies going on, both online and off. Um, and so thinking about how to navigate that, uh, so it occupies a lot of my time, um, but it's, it's also quite telling, you know, and so to me it zooms out and pulls into larger ideas of identity. Um, of course, we love this idea of the great artist, the individual genius, but now I feel like more than ever, um, we are hyper-networked, we are hyper-interconnected. Things like the social media platform and performativity you need to kind of perform your own persona on various corporate platforms, and that somehow will have a direct bearing on, again, bookings if you're a musician and all these other things, um, on down to things like rent. Uh, but in short, um, I am really interested in an era when the idea of independence is going away or gone, um, and then how do we start thinking about interdependence? Um, you don't have autonomy, but you still do have many different options. Um, and so that sort of, the nutshell of this experience taught me, if nothing else, that you strengthen the networks you participate in. You can't simply withdraw, step out, you know, be outside the system. The system is embedded. It's inside us, it's inside you know, our phones, it's everywhere. Um, but who you talk to, who you listen to, who you dance the party with, um, those are the things that end up making kind of an incredible, incredible change. And so much of that, you know, it's just thinking of um, doing some clubbing here in Berlin, so much of that, the communities that come together around electronic music can be very fragile, very fugitive, and very fleeting. But there's often an incredible power even in those moments um, where you choose to do your thing and how you choose to add your voice to the sound. So I will stop talking for now, and maybe if anyone else has any response to something I've, I've um, discussed in the past 35 minutes, there are microphones at either side of the front of the house. Um, if you could come up, and we could maybe turn this into a kind of conversation. Oh, and I could do this. Hi. Um, yeah, first off, this is really fascinating. Thanks. And ooh. thank you, PA. Um, oh, I got it. Um, yeah, so uh, one thing I noticed is that you, you, know, you mentioned uh, dispossession and that being sort of an essential part of the African American experience, mm -hmm. um, or I guess the African experience in mass, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so my question is that 
uh, in the context of, you know, I mean, specifically Moby's play, but the Mobys of the world that do incorporate all, um, all these elements, to what extent do you hold them accountable for perpetuating this dispossession? Mm, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, in, a, in a weird way, I think the funny thing, you know, proceeds on a case by case basis. It is, it's never a simple, like, yes or no, right or wrong, but for me, at least, it's always a kind of like, it's, it's simply, it's a relationship. Um, and so when I think of that relationship, I think it's about moving towards more acknowledgement for the sources of input that are sort of powering whatever, you know, your various energies. Um, and yeah, the, the more visible someone comes, the more money they make in the, in the case of Moby. I think there is a, a much, much greater responsibility for them to be kind of responsive to this. Um, and it's precisely because music is so malleable, it touches so many of us so deeply in so many different ways, um, that that very slipperiness kind of needs to be acknowledged because it can be so easy to be like, this is my thing, you know, boom. When it, it's never about that, you know, it's, it's always about a kind of supportive scene behind it or a supportive group of people that you may have zero connection with. Mm. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yep. I am super interested in this idea of fan art as a folk music. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm really attracted to the idea of people taking, you know, commodity culture and um, you know, re reclaiming ownership over it. I mean, if Theodore Adorno was here, he would say, yeah, but they just end up getting owned, right? Like you can never make that commodity culture your own. You always get sort of sucked up into it. What, what would you respond? Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's like, the thing, the, yeah, I, I too love fan art, fan appropriation. Um, and the, it's in a way, I would say, Mr. Adorno, um, it's, n it's not about ownership in this case, or dispossession, it's about, at the fan art level, it's about modulation. It's simply about interrupting their signal with your own curves and waves and spin on it. Um, and so it turns into a form of talking back, and it turns into a form of participation. And that's, I'm not sure if I made it clear, but one of the thrilling things about World Music 2.0 is that for myself and many, many other people, you, you know, the musical experience begins with something like fan art, like you just do a quick edit bootleg remix. Um, but then if you want to stick at it, maybe you say, oh, okay, how could I add more of my voice? How could I take out the, you know, the Beyonce samples and still have it bounce or whatever? Um, yeah, and, and the, it's music, it's this constant, like the ownership thing is so very real. Um, it's because there's actually so little money to be had in, in selling music, right? Um, it's, you get a lot of machinery that's trying very hard to extract maximum value from any particular song. Um, but the fact is, like almost every sort of meaningful musical experience that we have, from sitting down and stitching together the fan art to just like, you know, like driving around with your friends and listening to something, so much, so many of the moments where music has the most value to us as humans, the money is the furthest thing, you know, from the room. Yep. Um, hi, oh. I'm Rafi. Should, should, sorry. Okay. Yeah, he, he can go. Okay. I'll go next. <laughs> uh, thank you for the presentation. I like uh, the Egyptian part, the music. Uh, I'm Rafi. I'm uh, rework on Arabic uh, music and I uh, remix it with the house and uh, Berlin vibe. Okay. What, uh, um, and my problem is here, it's uh, I want to avoid the politics mm. thing. Uh, so like when I play, um, okay, this is, uh, people here, they have this vibes, okay, you're playing music from area, there's a lot of things happening there, so I am dealing with uh, politics and nationalism, mm -hmm. and this is, I don't know how I can avoid that, I just I want to play music for just the music, as you said, it's a conversation, mm -hmm. but it's like people, they give it to high level of politics and mm -hmm. uh, this energy of uh, bringing bad stuff. Yes, like here, I guess the question is like, he, the politics entering into it, like you don't want, I would love to hear a bit more about that. Is it the idea that the audience are like, oh, this, is pol this music is 
political because it's like Arabic music or, or something? Or is it... It's like, it's bring a discussion after mm. that. Like mm-hmm. sometimes, okay, can you please uh, play more Syrian music, okay. more than Egyptian music? Oh, and funny. So this is like, you know, yeah, this is event. Okay, people were from... So this is the what's more happening here. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So, so it's so it's like nationalism. National. I see. So people in the audience who know from who can understand the lyrics, understand the Arab, but they're like, why don't you play from my country, this country, and then yep. nationalism just and you're like, ah, uh, you know. But you're like, yes, that makes a lot of sense because one of the exciting things about so much like abstract electronic music is it's at least thinking of a. You know, it's not about a nation state. It's not based on language. It's in the side. It's kind of freeing in that sense that so many people can enter into it in so many different ways. Um, the sort of uh, it's not a universal grammar, but a four-four beat can be very, very open, and it can be very, very open to, to overlays of things. Um, but that's yeah, it's tricky. You know, and I think part of like being a DJ, musician, and a promoter is thinking of like how do you, you know, of course, it's a DJing as a dialogue with the audience. But if the audience is kind of wants to be conservative and kind of balkanize things, you're like, sometimes you need to really struggle against that to push back, you know. So like when I'm DJing, a lot of my sort of DJ style involves beginning somewhere, some genre, some sort of maybe area, and then slowly moving through different spaces. And so people have more or less identification with the sounds as the night goes on. And I do that because that's how I listen and love music, but it's also really playing with audience comfort zones. Like you want to get people dancing to, I don't know, some Debka music from Syria, but then slowly bring into, you know, some of the Egyptian electro shabi, Mahraganat or whatever it is, and then bring it into, you know, Berlin house or whatever. So yeah, yeah, I think it's, I guess like a sort of a broader thing is that there's the notion of a club space, it's usually like, okay, you're going to the club, it's going to be a party, it's going to, everything is going to flow. Um, and that's fine, but moments of like friction and discomfort <laughs> and confusion are very, very welcome, you know? And, and periodically, actually, you know, late last night at Treasure, I was like, okay, this 4-4 beat, it's being replicated all over the city and all over the world right now. We're just sort of like dancing along to this machine, and it's kind of terrifying. Um, and so... Um, so that's why we want polyrhythms. That's why we want moments where the beat drops out um, and just to get a sort of different relationship. Um, and as you say, there's this kind of intense, the coffee's kicking in, if you can tell. <laughs> there's this very intense relationship between, um, it's like all the freedom of a, the, being a body on the dance floor and the sweat. And, the, and then like nationalisms will still, still descend. Language barriers will still descend, you know? So it's the kind of the fight for the sort of utopia space of play. Um, requires the noise and the dirt and the derailment of the train from time to time. Yeah, that, thank you. Thanks. Hi. So you were you're talking a lot about monetization and that that it's become harder uh, for independent artists. Mm-hmm. Uh, but how do you think independent artists can monetize their music and how should they find that balance b- between creativity mm-hmm. and monetization? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's so. I mean, like the the short answer is that, you know, there is this, for better and for worse, there's a huge emphasis on live performance. Um, And what that means nowadays, even more so than 10 years ago, is that the live performance needs to be somehow presentable. Like like the visuals actually matter more and more, um, which is is depressing to me. Like you need a good Instagram feed somehow, (laughs) and you need a good social media presence, like, and then maybe the music is third in the list. and then at the same time, like, especially thinking of here, like Berlin, the city which is sort of like music is becoming a bigger and bigger economy here. Um, so at the same time, there are all these other sort of like adjacent areas of music that where money can happen. Um, but I guess I, I am a kind of a believer in, um, in, the, in the power of the form not when it's disconnected from money, but when it's, it's kind of evolving on its own way, and then you think, okay, I've made this thing, how can I tour it? You know, is it, do I need to apply for grants? Do I need to start, you know, doing a job just so I can fund this thing in order to get a certain amount of visibility, X, Y, and Z? But all these um, increasingly, it's a complicated analysis for every artist. Um, and one of the one of the sad things about it is that, or one of the reasons why music skews sort of to the, towards the young is that um, 
the longer you do it, actually the more difficult it is to sustain in a way. And so there's no easy answers, you know, like me, I've been DJing what for internationally for like 16 years now. Um, but yeah, this past year, my sort of income is a very strange mix of like book writing and giving talks and doing a little bit of teaching um, and then DJing. And even within it, aesthetically, like there are moments where, you know, years when I'm like, I'm, I'm big in France this year, I'm going a lot to France, like somehow there's a connection with what I'm doing, um, and then that will drift away. And, and so uh, one of the things about a life in music does to you is it requires you to travel a lot, not to chase the money, but where opportunities, economic opportunities lie that over, overlap with your interest, it's always going to be very distinct. This is, this is what I've found. Thank you. Okay, so I think that's, that's it. I think we're out of time. Um, thank you very much, and I'll linger at the front.